If you want to stop caring what others think, if you want to move through the world with confidence and grace, if you want to build the business, master your craft, or get what you want out of life, here are eight steps to just stop giving up. We're going to go over the three pillars of self-confidence so you can stop caring fast, why you care so much in the first place so you have the awareness to stop, how to reprogram your mind to become who you were meant to be, why you are probably on a life path that has a 100% failure rate and how to escape, how to develop your own internal compass and find what you want in life, the passion process for discovering your interests and turning improvement into obsession, a tool to accelerate changing your life, and last, the nature of reality and how it can help you become more intelligent so you stop worrying about minor inconveniences. Now I don't want this to turn into some superficial band-aid of step-by-step -step advice that you can find anywhere online. I want you to solve this problem for good, but in order to solve a problem for good, you need time and awareness of the problems that come up as you start solving the problem or once you solve the problem. As an example, in terms of the problem of caring too much about what people think, you're not going to target the right problem the first time around. You're going to think that it's some competence issue because competence equals confidence and then you're going to solve that and you're still going to be unconfident and at that point you need to become aware of the problems that allow you to truly solve the problem so this isn't a quick fix you probably aren't going to stop caring about what other people think by the end of this video and that's okay you're going to be armed with the tools and awareness that i give you in this video so that you can eventually solve the problem for yourself because Again, this isn't a band-aid. You aren't just solving it all at once. It takes cultivation. Mastering your mind is a massive undertaking, and that's what it takes to genuinely stop caring. And to start mastering our mind, that's going to require us to go very deep in this video. But before we begin, I have a subtle reminder. We've been building Cortex for a little over a year and a half now. I'll go over that story another time, but for now we are actually starting to roll out access to the waitlist. So this is a form of a soft launch. We aren't launching to the public yet. You have to be on the waitlist and we will slowly roll it out to you as we get through this month. So you've been hearing me talk about it for so long now and you can finally get access and I'm super excited and it's really coming together nicely. I've been using it for the past nine months or since whenever I've had the base version of the app, I use it to write all of my content. I use it to create all of my YouTube videos, not actually like film them, but ideate them. I use it for all of my ideas, my captures, my it's just my second brain. And to get your mouth watering a bit, Taylin Simmons, a rather large creator, said it was like Notion, Obsidian, and Google Docs had a baby, and I would personally go as far to say uh, it also combines Apple Notes and Todoist, or your to-do app. Not completely, not all the features are there yet, but you can visit our public roadmap in our free community to see everything that we have planned for it. The reason I'm actually promoting this in this video is because not caring what others think is a byproduct of writing and cultivating your ideas and getting your mind into a second brain so you don't have those ideas to actually worry about. So if you want a place to capture all of your ideas without having one messy note where you lose them all, store your highlights from Kindle, web pages, PDFs, tweets, and anything that integrates with Readwise for now until we develop our own reader and ways of web clipping, having an interconnected second brain that breeds articulate and unique writing. So if you're a creator and you want to create deeper videos, this is for you write landing pages, social posts, video scripts, or any of your creative projects. And since this is a rather large and could be complex app, we have a free community and a free second brain course that you can take. I put a lot of time into actually building out that process myself. So you can join the Cortex waitlist for now until it's truly available to the public with the link in the description, or you can even just join the community right now and take the second brain course without even going or downloading Cortex. Thank you for listening to my self-sponsorship back to the video. The first thing that we're going to talk about is the three pillars of self-confidence, because if you care too much about what other people think or you give too much of a fuck, that's a self-confidence issue. The first step to not giving a is understanding the big picture of self-confidence, not just some shallow advice. If self-confidence were as simple as watching a YouTube video on confidence, we would live in a utopia. There is something much deeper going on, and I hope I can make you aware of it in this video. Lack of confidence is the one thing that plagues the potential of the majority of the population. They care too much about what others think. So let's say you want to start a business and the negative thoughts start rolling in. What will my parents think? 
What will my friends think? What will my spouse think? Will it be enough to replace my income? How long will it take? Don't even get me started on the thoughts that come when you actually start building the business. The reason people fail is because they can't lift the emotional weights required to achieve the goals they set. What I mean by that is certain goals require a certain level of mind or a certain expansion or development of your mind. When you're learning skills and you're practicing things, you're effectively expanding the complexity of your mind. And so the reason you aren't where you want to be in life is because you just aren't the person with the mind that would be able to achieve that goal. So with all of these thoughts in our head, the 60 to 80,000 thoughts we have in a day that just splinter off into even more and make us stress about the future, how do we begin to cultivate the trust in ourselves that starts to lead to self-confidence? So the first pillar is perspective. When you enter a situation where you don't feel confident, anxiety shoots through the roof. This closes your mind to everything but your thoughts. They multiply. You completely retract from the situation and become a slave to your past. The experiences you've had before, but probably aren't experiencing right now, you are just pulling your past experiences into the current situation and then it becomes bad. My girlfriend, as an example, is trying to become a Pilates instructor and open her own studio and all of this amazing stuff. But she told me yesterday that she used to hate doing one specific exercise, the teaser, because it was extremely hard for her. She didn't want to go and practice it. But then once she started to get it, she held the position for like half a second, and now she loves doing the exercise. So I'm not saying that you can necessarily change your perspective of a situation to begin with, but you do kind of have to push through some pain until you make that slight bit of progress that helps you shift your perspective so that you can start to enjoy going into those situations. It's the same with anything, self-confidence in the gym. You hate going to the gym until you actually feel like you're getting stronger and then you just can't stop going. So to practice this, when you enter a situation and anxiety sparks, pause. Zoom out to see the situation for what it is. It's just a normal situation. And then transfer consciousness to those in the situation with you. Transferring consciousness is adopting another person's perspective. Because the thing here is that most people are just people, right? We create these images of people in our heads like, oh, that guy's super confident and I'm not on his level, so I feel anxious right now. But when you think of it, like they're not thinking that. Billionaires are people with the same problems. Fitness models are people with the same problems. All of these shiny and standout people and public figures are just normal people, but they have a different public perception. And when you talk to them, I'm not discounting other people's problems. I'm not trying to discount your problems here. I'm just saying that these people suffer as much as other people do. A billionaire can be in an absolutely incredible position and someone else thinks they'll be happy in their position. Maybe they will for a bit, but that's not how the mind works. A situation normalizes. Someone who goes from very poor to becoming a billionaire with enough time that becomes normal to them and they can have just as problematic thoughts. The material, the polish on the outside is not the thing that brings happiness or solves your problems. We should all know that by now. Again, it's mental mastery. It's perspective. The second pillar of self-confidence is perception. So you gain perspective of the situation on a big picture, and then you perceive the opportunities in the situation. So an example with perception, and the reason behind perception is that you're trying to spot opportunities for growth and improvement and places to contribute, because that's how you rid yourself of anxiety. You're not bored, you're not anxious. If you understand the skill challenge match that pushes you into the flow state of pursuing a challenge that is just slightly above your skill level or on par with your skill level so that it becomes fun to you, that's what makes situations fun to you. And that's when you stop caring, the flow state. You don't have a worry in the world. So an example of perception is if you have the perspective of social media as a toxic and just gross place that you don't want to be while you're sitting there scrolling and letting it flood your mind because you're addicted to your phone and you can't get off of it. Instead, I would encourage you to Change your perspective to the fact that there are a lot of creators pursuing meaningful lives on social media, dishing out good ideas, dishing out education, changing people's lives. And when you start to want to get into that space, you can only then, once your mind is in that position and perspective, only then can you actually perceive the opportunities of that space. You start to see social media posts or videos as inspiration for your own. You start to see someone who posts about a problem as a business opportunity to help them and build a product or solution 
solution for them so that you can actually start making progress and not just become a slave to your own mind of, oh, this is so toxic, I hate it. it make it make sense, make it make sense. Now, the thing you need to understand with perception is that it goes both ways, right? You have to change how people perceive you in the world for the goals that you want to achieve. If you're in business, you're going to have to look somewhat presentable or with the times, or you're going to have to display yourself in that way. If you look and act like just some sloppy person, someone's not going to want to do business with you. So you can go on social media, you can do other things, you can spot opportunities in situations. But if other people don't perceive you as worthy for those, then you're probably not going to get it. So I'm not saying to not be authentic, quote unquote, I'm telling you to be authentic. I'm telling you to do whatever it takes to achieve your own goals but not conforming to someone else's goals. That, and that's probably why you're hesitant to change your behavior is because you're not that serious about your goals. Now, the third pillar of self-confidence is practice. The typical thing that you hear about self-confidence is competence equals confidence. And as you can tell, that's pillar number three. That's not all the pillars. That's not all that it takes. How good you are at something allows you to perceive situations better. Think of skill acquisition as a way to increase your level in the game of life. In a video game, there are skill trees. As you play the game, you choose skills to help you play how you want. As you practice those skills, you increase your experience and new skills become available to you. The key point here, you are not able to access other skills until you practice the ones available to you. So the reason you care too much or the reason you give too much of a fuck is that you're just living too far into the future. You haven't bridged the gap and understood that you actually have to develop yourself to get to that point in the future. The other thing is that because you haven't practiced it's much more difficult to perceive opportunities in situation because you just don't have the skill to take on those opportunities. So to wrap this all up in terms of the three pillars of self-confidence is to one, just improve your skill set and actually do something rather than just wallow in your own self-pity of, oh, I care too much what people think or I give too much of if you're not doing something about it, then you're going to be stuck there. It's not as simple as this video and just like, oh, this one sentence that Dan said made me not give a for the rest of my life. As an example of this, my first successful endeavor was freelance web design. And that's a single skill that anyone can learn relatively quickly. So I wasn't that confident. Honestly, I knew that I was replaceable. I knew that I had a lot of competition. And I knew that if I wanted to do something not only more profitable, but more irreplaceable, I would have to learn more skills. So I started studying marketing and copywriting and funnel design. And eventually that led me to understanding the creator business and realizing, oh, why am I doing cold emails here when I could just build an audience? Because I understand that now, because after studying all of these different skills, I can perceive the opportunity of social media and I can hop on it that much faster because I have the experience and skill set to do that already. And then once I started doing the creator thing, I started to realize, holy crap, the only thing that I'm doing right now for most of my days is writing. And so I started to label myself as a writer, which you would think is a single skill, but it's not. Writing is just a complementary skill to every other skill that makes it 10 times better. If you want to learn writing, check out Tour Writer or of course, download Cortex. Step number two is to understand why you care in the first place because awareness begets improvement. Today, so many hundreds of thousands of years later, we have the same brain designed for the same purpose, but because we have increasingly gained control of our environment and the physical pressures have loosened dramatically, the dangers have become much more subtle. They come in the form of people, not leopards, and their tricky psychology and the delicate political and social games we have to play. And because of these less obvious dangers, our greatest problem is that our minds tend to become less sensitive to the environment. We turn inward, absorbed in our dreams and fantasies. We become naive. That's a quote from Robert Greene that I believe beautifully illustrates what we're going to talk about in the next section because it's going to get quite weird and abstract. You care too much because it threatens your self-image. You have an image of who you are in your head, and when a thought, idea, or opinion conflicts with that, your emotions start to flare up. You retract. You get trapped in survival mode. The only thing you can focus on is the opinion of another person. From there, and because you failed to pause and open your mind, it amplifies and dominates your mind. Humans and animals have one major difference. Animals attempt to survive on the physical level. They feel threatened when their physical body is threatened. They attempt to reproduce the information in their genes. Thanks to the emergence of self-reflective consciousness, humans attempt to survive on the physical and mental level. We feel threatened when our physical body is threatened, but also when our mental body or our self-image is threatened. 
We attempt to reproduce the information in our genes, but also the information in our consciousness. We write books, communicate, text each other, and choose political sides so that the web of ideas that we identify with survives beyond our death. Ideas are mental sperm. By reading a book, the author is mentally impregnating you. Your self-image is the child of all of the ideas you've been exposed to your entire life. Artists attain immortality when their ideas become immortal, like how we reference Plato and Aristotle long after their physical bodies are gone. In a future video, I want to talk about this a lot because I want to talk more about writing and the creator economy and personal brands, but I need to create a video on how to set yourself apart by the depth of your ideas and how to kind of make yourself immortal in this sense because Aristotle and Plato, if they were around today, they would be the top creators, so to say. They would enjoy the technology and they would create like this. And so starting to think like that, how are you going to be the person whose ideas lives on even in the age of AI? when there's just so much information, how do you stand out? Now, what we just talked about may have sounded weird, and it is, but I'll let you reflect on it and determine its validity. And if it helps, you don't have to think of it as mental sex. Think of it as planting and watering seeds so that they become flowers in your mind. And it's kind of the same thing when you think about it, right? As above, so below, that's just plant sex. So why do we care what others think? Because we want to survive. We are wired to be accepted by the tribe. If we aren't accepted, we will become outcasts. We will lose our resources for survival. Your parents will kick you out if you don't agree with the ideologies they've so heavily identified with, like being a Republican, Democrat, Christian, Muslim, or if they've identified hard enough, they will despise you if your favorite sports team is not the same as theirs. This is an extreme but quite possible case. Your beliefs go to battle with your parents' beliefs, and they will do whatever it takes to survive. The psychological feeling of you questioning their beliefs is on par with them being stabbed physically. And if they aren't a developed person, they'll stab you back by kicking you out of the house and you'll feel that pain because now your physical body is at stake. Now the thing here is that in a lot of cases, it makes sense to care what other people think because by then you're playing a strategic survival game. You're trying to survive. But if you've been here long enough, you understand that I believe one of our purposes in life is to transcend our survival. I'm actually writing about this in the new book I'm writing, and I'm illustrating it as levels of purpose. And the first purpose that you have to actualize is your survival purpose. You have to transcend your survival so that you can think bigger, open your mind, and start to think about creative work or contributing to others or even care about starting a business or spirituality or any of that. In other words, you have to develop the skills and you have to solve the problems in your life in the health, wealth, relationships, domains that allow you to transcend your survival and become somewhat independent or autonomous. But the thing here is in 95% of most of modern cases, when we can learn anything and do anything and build anything, caring what other people think is close to useless. You're not actually being threatened. Your life isn't actually at stake. You just feel bad because someone questions something that you believe. Now, step number three, after understanding self-confidence and understanding why you care in the first place, is programming your mind to stop caring because now we understand the mind. We have the awareness. We understand where we want to be. We understand what's causing the problem. Now we need to, when we notice that threat, that psychological threat where we feel the stress or the anxiety, we need something to do so that we can start to reverse that. You care what people think because your mind is programmed to. It's second nature to you. You were programmed as a child to follow orders. Your mind programmed itself to survive. You registered threats to your survival, like touching a candle flame when you were young, as a bad thing. It makes sense you didn't want to be scolded or scorched. That's negative feedback, and your mind interprets it as such. Your parents probably didn't teach you how to master your mind because they didn't master theirs. So here's how you start reprogramming your mind. First, you need to break the unconscious habit. You need to stop the program from executing. Anytime you feel an emotional reaction, pause. A pause is an opportunity to change your mind. Second, practice metacognition. Question your thoughts and allow your mind to open from its narrow state. Ask the question, do I actually care about this? Seriously, when you like make this a habit, when you start feeling something, this is this can be so life-changing, is when you start feeling something, just ask, do I actually care about this? And the answer, most of the time, is no. Now, the last thing of this step is that this may not be possible in the moment. You may 
succumb to your survival instincts. But that's okay, because we have this beautiful thing called self-reflection. We can look back to the past, and then we can start and think, and we can even execute that habit after the situation is already done. You can look back on that situation and be honest with yourself. Did I actually care about that? And that primes your mind going into the next situation to go about it in a better way and start to reprogram that through physical action. Now, step number four isn't really a step or something actionable. It's more about understanding. It's understanding that society's path has a 100% failure rate. What I mean by that is you're probably on a path that is going towards a dead end. And the reason you care what other people think is just for that reason. You're on a path that you didn't set yourself, so you're not in control of it. You don't feel confident in your path because it can be taken from you at any time. So a quote from Naval to get this started. The only real test of intelligence is if you get what you want out of life. So you care what other people think because you aren't confident enough to survive on your own. You have someone that has to pay your bills. And by bills, I mean almost everything in your life. You have a car payment. You have a house payment. You have to pay for food. Money is so deeply intertwined with modern survival that if you don't have a way of controlling how much money you make, you're not in a very good position. This is another point from the book that I'm writing where money is such a beautiful thing because humans created it as a tool to transcend our survival and trade to build this technology that build technology, products, and services to trade with other people to get what we want out of life and to not have to live such terrible lives. So money for a lot of people is such a dangerous thing because so many people have a bad relationship with it and just label, well, one, their conditioning and programming takes over and they say money's evil or you don't need a lot of money to be happy. And both of those are half-truths. It depends on the person. Now, going forward, I'm going to say a few things that are probably going to offend you. So just practice your non-reaction right now. Practice, okay, I feel this reaction. Do I actually care? Is he telling some form of a truth? The first thing is that the default modern path in life is an automatic failure because you didn't set the destination in the first place. Go to school, get a job, buy the house, let 40 years happen, retire, maybe. You achieved what someone else wanted, not what you wanted. That's not intelligence. That's blind stupidity. You failed to question your programming. That's not success. That's complete and utter failure. Even if everyone around you perceives your material possessions as success, they're blind to the fact that you aren't a unique human being. Your personality and self-image is a clone along with the masses of society. Success, in my definition, is creating who you are. The quality, enjoyment, and satisfaction in your life is the byproduct of that. The second point is that the school system is a construct made to keep people dumb, even if that wasn't its intention. Schools were created to educate people into specific roles within the kingdom or society they were in. That's just why they were created. The keywords there are specific roles. For the entirety of their education, they pursued one goal, the goal they were assigned so that they could achieve a certain level of status so others would think of them as important. That way they could survive and acquire resources from others. That one goal framed any and all of the knowledge they had the potential of acquiring. That's what goals do. They frame your mind to learn new information to reach that goal. They studied one domain, like history, finance, or biology. They studied a part, not a whole. They studied the material, not the relationship. They studied the dot, not the web of connections. The result is a lot of knowledge in one field that makes them useful to someone else, not themselves. They only have the option to be a slave of someone who needs their expertise. Not physical slavery, but mental. They don't have the generalist understanding that allows them to create their own path toward the goal they set for themselves. So what does this have to do with caring what other people think? Because it is incredibly destructive to learn solely for the sake of achieving the goal someone assigns to you. It will lock you into a singular path for the sake of status. It will turn you into a narrow-minded clone who doesn't see the depth of life, because if you were to see the depth of life, you would stop caring. And we're going to talk about that in step number eight on cosmic thinking. But before that is step number five, which is embracing nature's compass. Do you know how the mind works? The mind is a system that aids in achieving known goals and discovering unknown goals. Your mind is always operating, scheming, and making sense of reality based on the goals that occupy your mind. This is cybernetics, psycho-cybernetics. These goals, most of the time, are the result of the values you accept from your culture, the information fed to you by parents and teachers, biological needs to survive, and more. Your goals are often the product of the environment you are in. Now, why is this important? Because understanding it will determine the outcome of your life. The goals that occupy your mind determine what you perceive and what you learn. Your mind automatically accepts or rejects information to aid in achieving the goal you are pursuing. As an example, if you only have the goal to go to school and get a job, you will only notice the aspects of life that help you achieve that. 
But if you had the goal to live the best life, something a tad more holistic and almost never ending, an infinite game, you would notice much, much more. The goals and skills available for your discovery and acquisition would be endless. Life would maintain its zest as long as you maintain that goal because it can easily be overtaken by society. Now the thing here, I've talked about goals so many times before, like in my daily routine video, the daily routine that changed my life. What you have to understand is that all of this is just flowing, right? I talk about identity, I talk about worldview and how that's composed of goals, problems, and paths, or purpose, process, and problem. That's your mind. That's how you perceive and operate in the world. But those things change. You can go up and down levels of depth. You can be in survival mode and be focused on that narrow goal. But the whole intention with this and with spirituality, maybe in a certain perspective, is opening your mind to consistently occupy higher states or higher levels of thinking and goals so that you can notice more of life and achieve more in it. Maybe not achieve more in it, although that will be a byproduct, but appreciate more of it. So the point here, you care what others think because you aren't in your own little world. You aren't consumed by your vision, mission, and the goals that comprise them to the point where distraction is impossible. Since goals frame how you perceive the world and therefore determine the opportunities available to you, the default path society set you on and any shred of its existence in your head is detrimental to your quality of life. Question everything you know, revolt against society, and find out what's true for yourself. Pay close attention to every single one of your thoughts and actions. Ask, did I set the goal that led to this outcome? So the question now is, how do you navigate life with certainty? You don't, and you weren't in a secure or certain position to begin with. For all I'm concerned, today is your birthday. You are no longer the identity that was assigned to you. You were born anew because you chose to be, and you can now begin the reprogramming process. So... Happy birthday. Forget about your constant craving for certainty and security. That will just trap you in another narrow-minded domain. Instead, we need to embrace nature's compass. Create a vision for your future, make it big and almost delusional, reverse engineer that into 10-year, 1-year, monthly, and weekly goals, break that down further into priority tasks that you need to do every day. Those priority tasks will involve self-education and problem solving. And by doing this, you effectively create a new frame for your mind to operate on. You have the big picture, you have the clarity or the process, and then you have the technical details, which is right here and right now. So if you can maintain that frame of your mind and it's truly important to you, it's very difficult to care what people think. Now, the thing here is that this is just not a static and narrow-minded frame. Your vision evolves. Things change. So after doing all of that, it just comes down to solving problems in alignment with your vision for the future. Start with tangible problems in your life right now. Fix your health, fix your money, fix your relationships, fix your mental health. Don't get distracted by problems that aren't within your direct experience. As you solve problems, new ones will reveal themselves. You can go to the gym to fix your confidence issues, but that will reveal a deeper problem. Self-confidence isn't solved with external looks. It's an internal problem, so solve that one. Start shallow because that's the only way to dig into the depths. How do you solve problems? Through self-experimentation, not accepting someone else's solution, ideology, or advice as law. You experiment with techniques and processes from others and find the intersection of them that leads to the problem being solved for good. Soon, you will realize that all problems lead to self-actualization and development. The deeper you go, the more successful you can be and the more skill you acquire along the way. So, so far we've talked about the three pillars of self-confidence so you can stop caring what other people think. We talked about why you care so much in the first place. We talked about how to reprogram your mind to become who you were meant to be by asking if you actually care. And we talked about why you're probably on a path in life that has a 100% failure rate. And we just talked about nature's compass or developing your own internal compass for identifying and solving problems by having a vision for the future and aligning all of your actions for that. So next, we need to quickly go over the passion process. We need to understand passion because it's extremely unfortunate that the word passion has become a bastardized version of its former self. The internet is flooded with headlines and marketing angles screaming that passion is useless, that you don't need to find it, or that you should do something else instead. But I believe passion is a great, worthy, and descriptive word. You can feel passion in your bones. And if you don't live a passionate life, what's the only other option? When you're passionate about something, you don't care what people think. You'll study it all on your own. It will be your escape. You'll have friends on a social level, but you'll be perfectly happy with your loneliness on an intellectual level because the topic itself is like your friend. At the same time, when you find the select few people that can match you on that intellectual level and have those deep conversations with you in a passionate way, that's irreplaceable. 
and very few people experience that in this life. So how do you discover your passion? First, passion is when improvement turns into obsession. Passion is the process of trying everything and discovering the one thing you can't pull yourself away from. Passion is not found from where you are now. It's discovered on the path of where you're going. Those are your guidelines. As you are solving problems toward your vision, experimenting with potential techniques and solutions you find through self-education, keep a steady eye out for signs of passion. Learning new information will become a hobby instead of a chore. Building a business will feel like playing with Legos as a child. The art of living is getting paid to play. We're going to talk about that in a future video. Now, step number seven is to write more because me being me, I can't help but include writing as a very important skill in almost every video I create because I have a two hour writer course, I have Cortex, I have all of these products based around writing. So technically that's my way of selling you on those things. But at the same time, I could go and sell anything else, right? I chose writing for a reason and that's because it's deeply impacted my life and my students' lives, and I believe it's just a worthy skill for most people to learn to increase their value. So you give me money or download Cortex for free. I give you fulfillment, potential career opportunities, and just the ability to think better. Your mind is the operating system for reality. When you learn how to think, you learn how to effectively navigate situations for the most advantageous outcome to your life and others. In other words, when you learn how to think, you get what you want out of life. And then we tie that back with Naval's quote about the real, the only real test of intelligence is getting what you want out of life. So the way to get what you want out of life is to learn how to think. How do you get better at thinking? By treating your thoughts and ideas as Legos. You aren't an intelligent thinker because the thoughts and ideas that compose your thinking are a jumbled mess. You aren't able to see them in their individual states and reorganize them. That's why we help with Cortex. Sign up. This is where writing comes into play. Writing is a tool to accelerate the conditioning of your mind. Write yourself into a worldview that leads to a better life. I feel my best personally when I write in accordance with who I want to become. I never really thought of myself as a writer until I realized how crucial of a skill it was for everything that I was doing as a one-person business and now as the co-founder of a startup. Video outlines, landing pages, text messages, emails, advertisements, social media content, etc. Even if I learned another skill like graphic designer programming, I still had to write using the other skills to get clients or customers for that thing. Everyone is a writer. Once you internalize this and begin to polish the skill that is involved with making your creative work a success, you start seeing benefits you didn't even know you were after. Writing forces you to organize and articulate your thoughts. You become a better decision maker. You slowly begin to navigate the chaos in your mind. Writing is the perfect feedback mechanism. If your readers aren't growing or you aren't getting paid for your work, that's a sign that you need to improve at writing with persuasion. The better you write, the better you think. And if your thoughts influence most of your habits, actions, priorities, and ability to make sense of complex situations, writing drastically increases your chance at success. You don't need an English degree to write. You already text your friends with more impact than most school papers out there. If you can convince a friend to grab dinner with you over text, you are a better writer than most academics in the real world applications that it matters in. So now thanks to the internet and social media, a simple text message like social media post can reach hundreds of thousands of people. And if you understand business and traffic, then you understand that that can turn into hundreds of thousands of dollars. The most impactful habit you can adopt is a 30 to 60 minute writing habit first thing in the morning. Make it conscious. Making yourself and your work a success hinges on your ability to get your writing free or paid in front of people who resonate with it. And we'll discuss this 30 to 60 minute habit in the future of how I write everything in the form of notes and those become the building blocks of anything that I write or just straight up turned into social posts. Now the final step, step number eight, this is one of my favorites because it's an idea that I've been contemplating and reading about and trying to articulate and it's just fun to do that. It's fun to stretch your mind and try to articulate something that you can't. So step number eight is cosmic thinking, cosmic with a K not C. Because if you want to stop caring what other people think, you need to zoom out. And when I say zoom out, I mean all the way out, as far as you can go, beyond the cosmos, toward the cosmos. For the ancient Greek philosophers, the world was a cosmos, with a K, used to describe the universe as an ordered and harmonious system. This is the opposite perspective of the reductionist scientific paradigm of today that sees the universe as a machine, trying to understand reality by studying its parts rather than the relationship between the parts that create a whole. The cosmos, in this sense, is close to synonymous with all interpretations of an ultimate reality, like God, 
Brahman, the infinite source Teotl in Aztec philosophy, and the rest implied by religious leaders and mystic masters. For the Greeks, when thinking in parts and wholes, the parts each served a purpose toward the harmony of the universe. So that's one thing there, is that you may care what people think, or you may feel out of place in wrapping in the other lesson of being on society's path, because you don't feel as if you serve a purpose as a part in the whole that you are within. So if you understand Ken Wilber's philosophy, and I think it's, his name is Arthur Kessler, not too sure, the one who coined the term holon, which is the fabric of reality or the building block of reality, a holon is both a whole and a part at the same time. So we're talking the building blocks of reality. We're talking cell to molecule to organism. We're talking word to sentence to paragraph to book. We're talking me to this room, to this apartment complex, to all the way to the universe interconnected with everything else because at the same time me connected to you via youtube as the whole everything's connected right that's the gist of it so you don't have a purpose as a part within the whole of whatever it is whether it's the grand purpose of the universe or just the grand purpose of your community or the purpose of the community you serve online because the internet in my eyes is the great unifier it's not the great separator of like with toxicity and such. I believe it has a lot of potential. Now, other philosophers like Alan Watts talk about the world as an organism, a functioning ecosystem bound by relationship. Aristotle believed that the final cause of a thing is its function, and that a full explanation of anything must consider its final cause. So this presents the field of teleology and cybernetics that we talked about earlier, about how your goals frame how you act and who you are. Humans are goal-oriented creatures. You always have a goal, but when that goal is assigned to you and you remain unconscious of it, you care what others think and it slowly destroys your life. By aligning with the purpose of your highest self and the purpose of the cosmos itself, life makes a lot more sense and you can begin to navigate it with grace. When it comes to not giving a fuck about a situation, you care what people think because you can't see the big picture. You can't see the ecosystem you are operating in. You don't understand your purpose, the purpose of those in the situation, and how both of those goals aren't in alignment. So of course, there will be mental conflict. So to take what we learned earlier just one step further of pausing and asking yourself whether or not you actually care, start to use this cosmic thinking or this systems thinking where when you notice the one thing, the reaction, you're stuck in a part. You can't see the whole because if you could see the whole, then you would be able to navigate that situation a lot better. So that's one thing you can practice doing is when you're in the situation, when you're angry about something, a thought, emotion, someone, something someone said, zoom out to the whole. What's the next layer? It's the situation. See their perspective. See or, or start to make connections between other situations that have happened similar to that and how the outcome of those ended up or how the goal ended up of those. And then even further, if you want to remove that tension even more, zoom out even further to the context of other people or the perspective of other people. Why are you caring so much about someone who cut you off in traffic when there's children starving on the other side of the earth? Your worries don't really mean much from that perspective. So you worry about things because you can't think holistically. And the reason I like calling it cosmic thinking rather than systems thinking is because to me, it comes off with more of that like magic or that spirituality in it, the the ancient Greek vibe. I just like that more. And I feel like it like romanticizes life a bit more for you. Cosmic thinking is about letting go, expanding your mind to observe the situation from a higher paradigm agnostic lens, understanding the purpose of the whole in its parts, yourself included, and navigating yourself toward a decision that is conducive to clarity in your mind and progress in your life toward that higher purpose. So again, when you feel yourself becoming tense and reactive, pause, zoom out, see the situation for what it is. If you can't control it, let it go. Find the connections that lead to order. Thank you for watching. I'm sure that was a pretty long video. So thank you for your time and attention. But while you're here, please sign up for Cortex. At least try it out. Test it. Of course, it's waitlisted right now. But once you get the email to get access, then test it out and let me know. Now, if you want even more, you can now, if you want even more, there's two hour writer to learn high impact digital writing. There's digital economics to turn yourself into the business. There's mental monetization to escape client work and build a digital product like subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Thank you for watching again. Bye.